I'm Reagan Brummagen and I am a librarian at the Corning Museum of Glass and it is May 23rd, 2014 and we're talking to Al Donnelly who worked with Corning Incorporated uh, about his uh, company history, his work time there and Al, would you just give us a brief overview of when you started? I think some people would be surprised to know that I worked there. I actually worked, but I did. I did. Uh, yeah, I joined the company in 1966. Uh, had been with the leader before that, and uh, I had the opportunity to join the uh, corporate PR group, uh, public relations group, and I did that. Uh, worked as the editor of the Gaffer for about two, two and a half years, and also in that time frame, uh, it was the heyday of television, and the company had more money than God, and going to build a uh, terrific Corning slick magazine, the Corning Magazine. And they hired a terrific guy, Chuck Petty, from DuPont to be the editor, and I was his assistant. And uh, as happens in business, uh, television kind of tanked a little bit, and the money wasn't so free, so we got six issues in of our quarterly magazine, and it folded. Uh, and uh, I could see the handwriting on the wall. Was and there a magazine after Corning no, the magazine? No, no. So it went from the Gaffer, which was the No, company. the Gaffer was still in going. It was, it, okay. It kept going on even after the magazine folded. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very beautifully done, slick magazine, dark star photography, uh, did all the, 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 the graphics in it, uh, and uh, extensive stories on our customers, uh, the people that we sold products to. Uh, one that was very interesting to me because it happened in my hometown of Albany was we used to sell light bulb blanks to an outfit in Albany that made billiard balls. And the light bulb blanks were the forms for that and then there was a whole story on how they were made, how they were polished, decorated, and you know, that was Corning's role in that. And that was, through the years, that's always been Corning's role is helping other people make their products the best they can be. Uh, we've always been an OEM kind of company. Explain uh, what that means. Other equipment manufacturer. Uh, the people who make television, the people who make cars, the people, they have products, material products and uh, needs, specialty materials, and they would come to us. Everybody out there that worked in those fields knew Corning. Uh, they knew them as a problem solver. And uh, we would come up with specialty materials and solutions. Uh, in dealing with the OEMs, we would uh, have a, a relatively small sales force because we weren't going out and selling it to the public, we were dealing with the guy that was building the product and mm -hmm. helping them come up with the kind of product that they wanted that would do the things that they wanted it to do. Uh, all these OEMs had their own trade shows uh, and our sales force for the materials that went to those OEMs would attend those trade shows and sometimes we'd have an exhibit. Uh, the Society of Automotive Engineers, the SAE, annual show in Cobo Hall in Detroit. Corning would have a presence at that with a handful of salesmen face-to-face -face with the people that have need of their services, of the company's services. And they would the be materials. marketing services at those or no, products? No, would be marketing materials. Materials. Be marketing the technology to do things with our materials that would help them build their product. I see. Okay. Uh, I mentioned the SAE. Uh, another would be the Pittsburgh Analytical Conference, which was always uh, for chemical uh, works in people that did all kinds of lab work in industry, health, healthcare, hospitals, you name it, instrumentations that they were into. We would make specialty glasses for pH meters. Uh, you know, they, they could be used in any number of ways and mm -hmm. we could tailor those things. Uh, uh, I think of another uh, 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 trade show that we used to go to, uh, SAE, uh, Pittsburgh Animal Conference, uh, IEEE. Uh, Institute mm. of Industrial, well, uh, Institute of Electrical and Elonics, Electronics Engineers. That's a mouthful. That is. <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, all the people that build with integrated circuits and televisions and you name it in the electronics or electrical industry, they would have a trade show and we would have a course there with materials talking about fritz and finished product and stuff that would help them uh, in their manufacturing processes come up with reliable products to sell to the consumers. So typically a, a company would come to Corning and ask them to help solve a problem they right. had. Okay. We were, we were basically seen as problem solvers. Corning's name was very well known by people in other industries, not so much by the people in the street. That came along when consumer came along. And when did uh, that happen? 
uh, well, consumer came in in the early 1900s with the introduction of Pyrexware, mm -hmm. bakeware, cookware. And that's how most of the, you know, people you might meet on the street would know Corning is through that. Yeah, they, uh, all of a sudden, uh, where we were dealing with individual companies, uh, to help them solve their problems, to get their end products out the door. Now we were dealing with a much broader audience. Uh, we were dealing with the whole retail chain for housewares. Mm -hmm. Talking about uh, department stores, chain stores, hardware stores, jobbers, you name it. And they have their trade show as well. It was uh, the National, the NHMA, National Housewares Manufacturing Association show, held every January and July, don't ask me why, January and July because it was held in Chicago. <laughs> uh, not those two months that you want to be in Chicago. No. Uh, but that's the way it's been all through its history except for one, one short year where they decided to try shifting it. It didn't work. So we go back. It's still there. Uh, but now you're dealing with uh, a whole host of people that you have to interface with at the trade show. The bigger sales force bringing in their customers in to that show to see the new products that we've come up with, uh, to talk about marketing programs. You know, it, it's a whole, whole different ball game mm -hmm. than we had as an OEM supplier. Right. Uh, so, so when you started, you were in sort of internal customer It was uh, internal. Marketing. It was a PR mm -hmm. inside thing, the, the Gaffer magazine. Uh, then, uh, that was only three years. When the magazine went, I uh, moved into product information for other divisions of the company, labware, mm -hmm. science products, uh, fluidics, you know, any number of things. And I dealt with trade publications and trade publication editors uh, to get news to them about new products, same idea, uh, get the word out about new products for their clients, their audience, and also see if we could place articles that were developed by our research engineers uh, in Sullivan Park. Uh, when they do a, a, a report or a paper somewhere, we would mine it for a, a legitimate storyline and market that to the magazine editors mm -hmm. for Industrial Week magazine or uh, uh, Electronic Engineering magazine. Uh, there are a whole bunch of them. So these would be marketed to professionals in that field. That's right. To the editors mm -hmm. in those publications, mm -hmm. uh, trying to get Corning's awareness of those products and capabilities out there. So did you have to work with the scientists then and the engineers and? Well, uh, yeah, uh, when, they, uh, when they prepared a paper or had a paper for presentation, uh, there was a time when all of those papers came through PR for review. Oh. Just a, uh, for readability and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, and uh, we would do some modest editing and send it back and say, you know, if I've changed the meaning of what you said in this paper about whatever it was they were talking about. Uh, I didn't understand it and maybe it needs to be reworked. And uh, we always got along pretty well doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we would get these articles, uh, we would shop them like a product to the trade or the appropriate media people, offering them exclusive publication of it or exclusive first time publication of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and trying to get our expertise out there in, in the world where it can be used. Mm -hmm. uh, among people who were interested in it. Where did the articles go that went back to the engineers then just filed away and... No, no, they w they w these were generally prepared for presentations at I those see. business conferences I was telling about. I see. Uh, they, they would go in, they would become a presenter mm -hmm. at the SAE show to talk about new ceiling glasses for health, for headlamps, for example. So that would be done by the, the, the engineers by themselves? By the researchers. By yes. the researchers yeah. themselves? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So you worked in that division for how many years? Uh, well, I was doing uh, work for a whole host of divisions. I see. Uh, for about for the PR. For, 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 yeah, for about another, uh, let's see, from '69 to '79, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was electronics, uh, like resistors and capacitors and delay lines. It was in science products, labware, chemical processing systems, uh, chemical recovery units. Uh, deal with uh, scientific instruments, pH meters, which grew into the medical diagnostic equipment. Uh, we got into some pretty exotic things like uh, blood gas analyzers and uh, 
white, white blood cell computer recognition systems. Making uh, those or making pardon? parts for those? No, or? making those, those were the actual systems, the, the machines that we made oh. for the use in health uh, or uh, research laboratories. I had no idea. No, well, a lot of people don't. <laughs> There's a lot to this company, and, uh, right. and as I said before, because we were an OEM company for so long, a lot of that is not uh, generally known mm -hmm. by the man in the street, by most folks, even yourself, who are now an employee. That's right. So, mm -hmm. so um, resistors and capacitors, I mean, what yeah. does that re how does that relate to glass? I mean, that's how well, people Well, because think they're of made of glass or sealed with I glass. See. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were made in Bradford. Uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, they were components, basically electronic components that were used in all kinds of electronic devices, televisions, radios, all, all your household equipment. Everything you do with electronics has got resistors and capacitors in it. I see. They used to be individual components, but integrated circuits came along and now they put it all on a circuit board and get a lot more function out of minuscule spot. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas it used to be a circuit board with resistors and capacitors plugged I in see. and wired. Okay. So it's a, it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. But yeah, we were in that business. So. What about fluidics? What is that? <laughs> Flu <laughs> fluidics? Flu believe it or not, fluidics used our photochromic uh, glass technology to expose patterns on photochromic glass, which when they were developed uh, could be acid etched and formed to create channels that then be sandwiched together and you would have a little block of which be in, in electronic terms you had a, a, an AND switch or an on off switch and the electric current goes one way or the other to, to, to accomplish the function they want. Mm -hmm. But if you're in an environment where they, it's an explosive environment or you can't have sparking, you want to use low pressure uh, forms of control that would not have sparking. Fluidics was a, an alternative for that. And it was low pressure air going through these little modules and it would, you could put together a whole circuit for, for example, uh, a product coming through a, a manufacturing line and you want to fill, let's say, a cartridge with gunpowder, <laughs> okay? You want to fill this with gunpowder but you want to measure that you got the right amount in there. Fluidics would sense uh, the the weight of the, the the movement of the scale would would either temper down the feed, cut the feed off, whatever was necessary, without causing any sparks in that environment. I see. Kind of kind of an important thing when you're building with munitions. Yes. <laughs> or explosive devices. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very interesting technology, and it was fun working with it. But it's, I don't think it's around anymore. No. I know it's not around anymore. Okay. But it was another use for a product that Corning developed: photosensitive glass. Right. And that was developed I, when? Pardon? When was that developed? That was back in the 60s. The uh, 60s, we were doing that okay. in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our people that were watching would remember Opel uh, Christmas ornaments. Yes. I don't know if you've ever seen yes. one. They're beautiful, white, they are. intricately, intricately etched. That's photochromic glass. They basically expose those products to a negative, process it under UV light to bring out the negative, and then in an acid bash, they were precisely etched to incredibly tight specifications or dimensions or whatever. It's just a beautiful works of art. Lightweight glass ceramic ornaments. Opel. Highly collectible now. Yes, they are now. <laughs> so did you have a science background before you no, started? No, I had none. No, no such. Because in PR, no generally luck. you're, you know, you're you know, a good writer, a good speaker. Um, uh, well, that, that was the challenge, I think, was uh, when I came from newspaper where you're always reporting on events mm -hmm. to uh, a company like Corning where you can be put in a position of uh, not only uh, writing news articles about products and developments but explaining those things to uh, uh, different audiences. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, it, and one of the things that we did uh, in the uh, product PR group was we would get our people on the Sullivan Park or wherever it, or sales manager, whatever, anybody, it's a logical candidate get them to agree to write an article for a magazine. Well, that's fine. Uh, you would have an article pledged to Business Week, uh, and you got a writer for it, then you got a deadline, and the writer gets sick. Now, he, he can't make it. And uh, that happened to me once with Fluidics, for example. Uh, a terrific guy, Roy Nutt, <coughs> excuse me, 
Roy Nutt came down with uh, pneumonia, and he was laid up in the hospital. And we had three days to get the article out, and he was in no condition to do it. So I wrote an article. I took a flyer at it and built a, an article for that kind of an application that I just described, and even drew up a circuit for it and sent it off to him to look at and say, you know, am I off base here? Or, and he sent it back and said, do it. So I sent it off and, and he came out in his byline. Oh, really? Very nice byline, but wow. uh, yeah, it, it worked. And, uh, <laughs> uh, those, uh, those were fun. Those were feathers in the cap that uh, when they came off, it was uh, kind of enjoyable to know that we pulled that one off. Right. Uh, uh, even had my name in uh, the, uh, oh boy, what's the, the American Journal of Medical Technology. Uh, for writing an article on electrophoresis. Now, don't ask me what electrophoresis is. Oh, I was just going to ask you that. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you do, we're both in trouble. But uh, it was on an article on electrophoresis and its use in, diagno in clinical labs in diagnosing a myocardial infarct, a heart in mm -hmm. incident. And it was used to separate enzymes out of a blood sample, sample. And the way it separated out, they could identify where those enzymes were being uh, uh, derived where, where they were coming from mm -hmm. and what heart you know the heart muscle that they knew that that's what it was and so we put together an article based on that hmm. and uh, my mother and father never understood that they <laughs> had an article <laughs> in that magazine with my name on it <laughs> my wife doesn't understand it either <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, it's been a fun it's been a fun trip it always mm -hmm. has so you worked for that um, in that function till 1979 yep and then uh, what happened? Well, in 79, the opportunity opened to, uh, to, to go over to consumer products as the uh, manager of their, uh, uh, the supervisor of their product information department. And, uh, uh, and that was a, a whole new can of worms for me because now instead of dealing with technical papers and everything else, we're dealing with newspapers and household magazines and women's pages and you name it. Uh, and we had uh, a whole different uh, approach to selling and marketing. Uh, you, you put together uh, marketing, uh, the, the sales marketing staff would put together these uh, great marketing programs and efforts that were linked to our customers who were now, as I say, the, the retailers, uh, Dillard's and Macy's and all these different uh, corporations that are in the business of selling our product to consumers. Uh, and it all began with Pyrex back in the, in, in the 19, I think it was 1915, 1916. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think somebody mentioned we're going to celebrate Pyrex yes. 100th anniversary coming up. Yes, the 100th so, anniversary sorry, next the time, year. So. 1915, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. uh, with glass bakeware. Now, folks didn't know about glass bakeware. What they knew about glass products is they break. And so, you know, they had a selling job to do. Uh, with convincing those people, people to yeah. that they could cook they, and they they use pans and everything and, and uh, uh, this went back to I guess uh, uh, the Littletons uh, Littleton family uh, Mr. Littleton was a, a developer in labware that made battery battery jars kinds of things big cylindrical bottom things that they used for research. And he cut the bottom off of one, and apparently the story goes, he gave it to his wife and said, see if you can bake something in that. And she baked a cake, and he took it to work the next day, and guess what? <laughs> Everybody <laughs> liked the cake, and <laughs> so they started looking into how they could use this borosilicate material uh, in a range of bakeware products, pie plates, cake tins, uh, and that grew into measuring cups and you name it, mm -hmm. a whole line of Pyrex products, which had been around now, in the next uh, year for a hundred years. And people, people swore by Pyrex. I mean, it was great. You could see through it. It was durable. It didn't change the flavors of the foods. It was what we call in the trade non-reactive cookware. It didn't change the color of your beans. It you know, didn't do all these things that other materials, uh, cookware right, materials would right. do. Uh, and uh, it cleaned easy. You know, it, it, it soak it and clip it out. So, uh, and it was very economical. We introduced those things, I believe, in somewhere in the $1 range for a pie plate. And decades later, we were still selling it for a buck or two. <laughs> uh, and, and of course, uh, dealing with that uh, as a consumer information person, uh, every now and then we get letters from somebody who would say, well, my, my 
plate broke. <laughs> Not supposed to. Well, you know, glass breaks. What, <laughs> what happens to people when they do something like that? They forget basic training. Uh, and we would, you know, work with it. And the biggest uh, solution we had for that, and the best solution was the Corning Promise. Uh, our Corning products from Pyrex and Corning Wear and on, just on the package, promised. If this product breaks in normal use, uh, send it back, we'll replace it free. And that's a guarantee that anybody can understand. You can understand it, I can understand it, the audience out there can understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it. It went over very well and it worked. It was uh, one of the real thrusts to making Corning consumer conscious and making consumers everywhere look upon Corning as a quality product. Mm -hmm. Now. In those days, it was just Pyrex. They didn't know Corning. The housewares, housewives of the country and everybody out there, cooked, they did not know Corning. The company. The, the glassworks, mm -hmm. Corning Glassworks. Cam Rutledge used to say, we're proud of that name. We're the only company that really works. Corning Glassworks. <laughs> Eventually it became Corning Incorporated, which it is now. But uh, the, uh, the, 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 the turnaround on that is we came out in 1958 with Corningware. A fantastic product, pyro ceram, durable, heat sent, heat resistant. You can do almost anything with it. You can put it in a block of ice, put a blowtorch on the other exposed end of it, and nothing, nothing tell, would happen to tell it. Tell us what pyro ceram is. Somewhere in the archives, over at your place, <laughs> you've got videos of those commercials where they're showing a, a, a corningware casserole dish half embedded in a block of ice and a blowtorch on the other end of it. <laughs> uh, I've seen a nail, there, yeah. a hammer and nails. Uh, well, and they, well, that came with. Uh, that came a little later with coffee cups, I think. Oh, it did, but, okay. Uh, uh, not, not something <laughs> I would do today. But what would happen is we introduced corny wear, mm -hmm. and a lot of the public, uh, the, the, the communicators, the, the newspaper people, from the Pyrex company, a new product, corny wear. <laughs> and so we kind of work our way around to becoming uh, known as the Corning company, you know, right. the Corning where glass works. But, uh, Tell us about Pyroceram, because I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between Pyrex and Pyroceram. Well, Pyrex is a borosilicate glass. It's heat resistant glass. Uh, came out of the need uh, by the railroad companies for lenses in their lanterns uh, that wouldn't shatter uh, because they had a, a candle inside creating heat on the inside of this lantern. And if they leaned out the caboose to signal the, the engineer that uh, something was going on or for get the engineer's attention, if the snow hit the outside, the glass would shatter and the light would go out. Uh, so, you know, that was a, a need. Because of the heat and the, and the cold together? Yeah, well, oh. yeah, cold. Pyrex is a material that you cannot use on top of the stove. It's always been that way okay. because what would happen is it, the, 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 the part in contact with the heat would expand faster than the, the, up, the upper layer of it and it would break, it would mm -hmm. shatter, it would, it would crack. Uh, so it, it's always been not for stovetop use, stamped prominently on the product. Mm -hmm. Corningware on the other hand, completely, it, it's the most versatile material you can get. You can do anything with it. Heat, go right from the freezer right into the, under the broiler. It, it, or back, you know, go either way with it. Uh, unique material, ideal for corning, uh, for microwave cookware. Uh, uh, for the same reason that it was ideal for missile nose cones. It was transparent to radio waves so that signals, directional signals for the nose cone could pass through it to wherever their, whatever information they were gathering uh, and, and to direct that uh, missile where it was supposed to go. And in the same way, it would withstand the heat of moving to supersonic speeds and back into atmospheric conditions. Hmm. It would break. So that function made it ideal for microwave because that's what microwaves are, radio waves. So the missile cones came first and then? Oh yeah, we were doing, my, we were doing missiles uh, and other coatings uh, before we had the, the, the Corningware product. I see. And it, because of that, someone thought to use it as a cookware, houseware. Well, sure. We, had, we already had the pieware. We already had the, the bakeware. So why mm -hmm. not take it to this much more versatile product mm -hmm. for the kitchen? So that made sense. And another thing is, I mentioned that you could uh, heat one side of it and not worry. 
with the when the microwave came out, we were able to put a an aluminum silicon. I don't know whether it was aluminum silicon or what. We could put a coating on the bottom exterior of the corningware, put it in the microwave for five minutes. It would get really hot. Then throw your eggs in there and scramble them on the spot, and make an omelet. They were microwave browning dishes. Terrific, absolutely terrific. I, I've still got three still or four of them at home. There's no way you're getting those away from me. No way. <laughs> Do they sell those still? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. oh yeah. Not a problem. Wait, the microwave came in the 70s? About the 70s, the yeah. The 70s, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so this was a new opportunity to use glass too because you couldn't use metal. It, 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 was, it was another advance in marketing, another mm -hmm. advance in a way to reach our audiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did the, the marketing division get back to, you know, the engineers and say, we'd like to have a product that, you know, would brown eggs, yeah. or did, did that ever exchange well, that, that's, happen? That's one of the beauties of Sullivan Park. You got a lot of very smart people up there just radiating ideas all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, they can come up with suggestions and send them down. or. Our people can find out from customers, gee, we would like to be able to do this, we'd like, and you send it up there. It's, it's a free exchange internally mm -hmm. uh, in the company between the products we make, the processes we use, and the people who develop them and refine them. And it works out, it's been a, a great, great synergy mm -hmm. through the years. But so, you mentioned Sullivan Park. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna tell a funny story here. Good. Uh, one of the things that we were into uh, back in the 60s and 70s was looking into materials that we could use in uh, chemical processing labs or analysis labs. And we were looking at enzymes, uh, trying to get uh, using enzymes attached to glass or attached to materials that can be used in analyzing stuff, okay? One of the things that they were doing was they were going to uh, do a study of uh, using blood draws from animals to study uh, enzymes. Uh, the, the thing I talked about, the myocardial infarct, mm -hmm. they were going to try to figure out how they could use attached enzymes on glass particles, which glass are being inert, would help separate, sort, do re reactions, uh, and, and, and help them diagnose. They were gonna do it with the blood of virgin sheep, virgin goats, virgin goats. And they had ordered a truckload of virgin goats to be delivered to Sullivan Park, and they had <laughs> set up a pen and everything. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm thinking, hey, we're in the husbandry business, wow. <laughs> what are <laughs> right. we gonna do with that? Uh, so anyway, this is a long story short, uh, they were expecting virgin goats. The guy that shipped them made a mistake and he presented a ram with a great opportunity <laughs> for the truck trip. <laughs> and when they, a few months later, <laughs> they discovered they weren't virgins. They were getting <laughs> little kitties. <laughs> so there was a story in uh, the magazine, in, in, in uh, uh, no, no, not the magazine, in um, Headlines in a Hurry, that Sullivan Park has goats. You know, you, you want a goat? We, we got goats. <laughs> so my so daughter, good. my daughter was going through a hard time. She had developed Osgood Schlatter's in the knee and she was going to be a softball catcher, but she couldn't anymore. She couldn't get involved in activities. She was in the dumps. And so I said, Kelly, how would you like to have a goat? And her eyes lightened up, you know, that's better than dog, right? <laughs> yes. So made a deal. If farmer out in the back has got a barn, he said, he'll let you keep the goat in that stable you can have it. So she ran back and she talked to the farmer. She came skipping back and I said, oh crap. <laughs> he said yes. <laughs> so we, I called up Howard Wheatall. Called up Howard Wheatall up there and I said, Howard, you got this, uh, you got sheep, the goats to give away. And he said, yeah. He said, well, listen, I want a male. And Howard says, well, I don't know. male, I don't know male from female. I said, Howard, <laughs> Howard, you pick him up, you look at him. If you've got a hangy down thing, it's a him. <laughs> you know, you guys up there in Sullivan Park, you're out of touch with reality. <laughs> so he, we chuckled. I got the goat. Anyway, long story short. And, uh, and it lived to be a, a 
pain in the neck, actually. We wound up giving it to a petting farm. God help those people. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there was, there, there, it was not all uh, nose to the grindstone. We had a lot of, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And that was when you were still working in the... Uh, in corporate, in, in, in corporate. the corporate mm -hmm. PR product group, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had people up there that were studying horsehair grass to see if we could, could mine silica from it. Silica being a basis for glass. It was a lot of pure research going on up in Sullivan Park in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's more directed now uh, to uh, customers and end products. Mm -hmm. And but then we, it was more theoretical, more abstract. Just yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we, we funded all kinds of things up there. Hmm. Yeah. So when you moved then to consumer products, mm -hmm. um, that was in 1979. Mm -hmm. And what was happening with consumer products at that period? Unfortunately, <laughs> my first, uh, my first, that happened in like uh, September. No, it happened. It happened in midsummer, and uh, I, was, I was aware that uh, we were going to have a, a a major corrective action done on a product, Corningware coffee pots, percolators, and. Uh, you knew that before you took the position. Uh, I yeah, I was aware of it because we had a minor problem. My predecessor had a minor problem with it before, and he had to do a job on that, and he did a great job, Al Warner. Uh, but this one was something that we couldn't fix and we couldn't replace. And the concern uh, was, uh, as with any time you have a product that has a defect, if the company says it's got a defect, you know, forget General Motors, but uh, if you have a, a defect and you tell people it's a defect, the first thing that customers want to do is replace it. They want to send it back, get it fixed. Uh, or get their money back or whatever. Uh, and there was a whole host of uh, contingencies on that. We introduced the product in 1958. It took off. Uh, by 1960, we had sold millions. And then it started to gradually go down. And for the last 10, 15 years through 79, uh, uh, there was not much sales in Corningware percolators. So we had this product out there that most of it, a great humongous percentage of it, was 20 years old. It was bought for 25 bucks. Uh, and it was still going strong in the households that they were in, but we, we had to get it out of service because what was happening is the bulb band separation would happen and people could get scalded and injured, and people did. So we worked very closely with the Consumer Product Safety Commission. We packaged a tremendous uh, program of awareness and buyback, uh, you know, get, get the products out of service. That was the, the objective. Because as I said, we couldn't fix it and we couldn't replace it. We were no longer making them. The market wasn't there anymore. Uh, so we put together this tremendous package of uh, dealing and with the blessings of the Consumer Product Safety Commission to engage in this thing. It was going to happen in late September. And uh, we had to, we, we, we knew that we were going to get a, a huge volume of mail response, but we had to have a mechanic mechanism set up somewhere to process large volumes of mail in a hurry, have a quick turnaround time, because we wanted to turn it around as, 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 as few days as we could. So you would send out a, like a rebate or a check or uh, Yeah, that's, that's what's like usually that. done. We mm -hmm. had a different problem. Oh. Uh, we knew we were going to get a lot of stuff, so we had to buy basically postal handling equipment to open the letters, scan the letters, file them in and, and quickly. So we built, we had a whole host of special equipment that was coming in and we trained and hired a staff to handle what we called internally the perk alert. And the perk alert was just that, it was an alert. Your product is defective, stop using it. And the message we sent was, send us the lid to the coffee pot you have and that will tell us what model you have, and we will make an offer back to you. That's the way it was going to be. We couldn't give them another coffee pot. Okay? So that turned into something of a problem because people wanted the coffee pot. Mm. Uh, they liked it. They, they trusted it. They didn't want to get And we get didn't rid have it. it. We, we couldn't do that. So, but uh, people did. They sent in their pots. But unfortunately, they came in before our system was ready uh, because I'm sitting in the living room on... Uh, Labor Day, Monday night, watching the first NFL game of the week, game of the season. And as we approach halftime, the announcer, and we're ready to go with this 
the CPSC, us, the, 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 uh, the distributing house for the news, it's all laid out. Uh, we're going to go with that uh, in a, like a third or fourth week of September. And by then we would have all of our stuff in line. First Monday in September, I'm watching the TV and the announcer comes on and says, Corning has announced the biggest recall in consumer product information, or the Consumer Product Safety Commission history. More at halftime. Oh, no. <laughs> so, other than avoiding defecation, <laughs> I went to the phone, called the outfit in New York that had all the, 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 the press kit, the press information, I said, send it now. Just get it out there now. Then I called Conrad Stemsky, who was then the, the supervisor, the, the, the vice chairman, vice president of our division, I said, Connie, oh. it, it, it's, it's out. Uh, I've already put the things in, in the motion. Uh, Bob uh, McCleary, who was overseeing the, the logistical side of thing, uh, we called him and said, you know, <laughs> we're off and running. We're going to start, we're going to start getting phone calls, you name it. And it was, it was just, it was a small, a small disaster because we had this swamped with all these letters, people wanting to fix my coffee pot and, and we couldn't do it. So we had to come up with it try to rough and we were trying to respond to those as quickly as we could manually I mean the equipment was it wasn't even on the bus truck coming in yet so we <laughs> fell we fell about a month behind in responses and that was not sitting well with consumer activists who's one of our key audiences you know, we always dealt with them uh, the, the consumer activists would be out there and, and they're getting complaints from consumers so they're complaining to us and they want us to answer the answer their consumers through them, okay? So it was, it was a wild, wild time from September through January. Uh, and interestingly enough, we had a staff of two ladies that travel all over the country doing interviews on TV uh, shows uh, talking about our products and the things we made for uh, you know, cooking and all that. Also educational tools that we made for uh, home economics teachers Mm. And they would talk about those because they were kits we put together for kitchen safety, microwave, understanding the microwave, how to be a good consumer, understanding warranties. So we, we put these educational kits together and we sold to the, uh, uh, the, the home ec teachers. Uh, and so uh, one of my young ladies that was out in Westwood happened to be in David Horowitz's studio. She was going to do a show with him, but she got bumped because somebody else came along. But she was in the. She was going to be in the studio, and I immediately called her and said, "You know, uh, you know, you're you're going to be with David in the morning, right?" She said, "Yes." I said, "Get to him now with that release because it's out, and he may want to uh, to break it, knowing David he'd want to break it uh, in our terms." <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so she tried to get him, and she got his attention and told him what was going on, and he says, "Corning's doing it. Forget it. They'll do it right." <laughs> So she couldn't get on. <laughs> so we lost an opportunity there. But uh, that seems to be the reaction we got from the people who knew Corning. And that was because of the Corning promise and the, the perceived the quality that mm -hmm. we always had, the, the promise to deliver. We couldn't deliver on that one. It took us a while to get over it. Uh, but uh, there a lot of interesting things came out of that. Uh, for example, we knew it was a, it was a popular product. It was probably, arguably, the most popular bridal shower gift of the day, okay? Because when we got these letters in, it was not unusual to have a package with one, two, and three lids for packages that were just being opened because of what we told them. They hadn't even been opened. They, they had one that they used, and they had others in reserve. People would get, you know, multiple, multiple coffee pots. and. Uh, so, long story short, uh, uh, we, we weathered that storm uh, and, and got out of it. Ironically, in the meetings with the, uh, the, the Consumer Product Safety Commissioners, uh, the chairman uh, looked at the pot and stood there and, and, he, and he said, well, I don't care what you do, you're not getting mine. I know what's wrong with it and I know how to take care of it. You're not getting mine. And a lot of people took that approach. Well, so you I've, suspect I've still, that you... I've still got them. Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you don't walk around the room with it, mm -hmm. uh, or you didn't. Uh, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting time. It was an interesting challenge. Uh, 
so much so that at the houseware show in Chicago in December, we had a, a hospitality suite for customers to come up and, and enjoy and, and everything, all meetings and what have you. And in the entryway was a credenza. And on the credenza, there was all these post-it notes. Uh, and at every show, you know, you'd go by and you'd look at them. There'd be, well, maybe there'd be a note or two for me. And most of them were for sales guys. They wanted to set up a meeting somewhere. <laughs> we walked into the room. Conrad walked into the room and looked at the table. And they were all, one after another, they were all with my name on them. I said, what the heck is this? I said, well, you know, I've been telling you, we need to get out a new story about where we stand with the coffee pot because we haven't done it and people are still complaining. And these are all people that deal with, you know, with they're the consumer people. activists. <laughs> they're, they're, and they're trying to get us to talk to them. And he said, well, get it out. <laughs> That's why we got it out the next day. <laughs> so trial by fire, your first experience, <laughs> yeah, right? right? That was, uh, that was, that was different. That was different. But, uh, so what were some of the other jobs you had with that division? Or well, overseeing uh, what well, jobs? Uh, I mentioned the, the, all the other businesses we have a handful of salespeople. Mm -hmm. They knew their customers and customers knew us. With consumer, we had a big sales force. We had a specialty sales force. We had uh, the, the retail uh, sales force. Uh, and they had their own trade shows. The National Houseware Show, I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Home Builder Show in uh, Las Vegas or in uh, uh, Dallas. Uh, they, every other two or three years in a row, and then they would move. These were people who built homes, built kitchens, and they would build whole elaborate displays. And in those, we would have our products uh, to make sure that they understood those. Uh, the extension home economists for uh, ag extension people like Cornell University That's agents, right. mm -hmm. they have a trade show. Uh, they, uh, the home economics teachers, the AHEA, uh, they have a trade show. Uh, American Women in Radio and Television, they have a trade show. And so we would go to those. Those were a special audience that our small group would go and interface with because they're the influentials. They're the people that would tell consumers, uh, their, their audiences, about what we have to offer, or what mm -hmm. Corning can do for them, that kind of thing. So we would go to those trade shows and uh, uh, we did that a lot. And we had those two girls I talked about that go around, they would book a two-week schedule of shows, uh, t appearances, then come back and work the next two weeks building up the next schedule, and they would flip all over the country. We lost those two people. One went off to get a master's degree, and the other moved out of our division into uh, specialty sales. We had Cornelius, uh, Cornelius O'Donnell, uh, who was a cook, a chef, not a chef, a cook, a very good cook, uh, who loved it. Uh, he would go out and go to with the sales staff, he would help put together programs where he would go into the Macy's, Bosch and Lom, you name it, all the uh, stores that, around and put on cooking demonstrations in conjunction with sales efforts that the sales guys and those uh, buyers would put together. And so that would go on uh, full time for, for Cornelius. Uh, with We Lost the Two Ladies, we put him on that circuit of getting him booked in other shows. As a result, we got him paid for his membership in the IACP, another key group, the International Association of Cooking Professionals. If I throw out Julia Childs or Jacques Papin, and all of those people that are in it, that's, that's, that's their it. group. That's mm -hmm. their group. And Neil was very much a part of them, uh, very close to all of them, uh, knew them all personally. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a great uh, deal that we wound up with. He wrote two cookbooks. He had a Cornelius for Corning uh, column that talked about cooking tips and recipes and the whole thing. Uh, it was built, it was a natural. And, uh, and that was fun working with him on that. I think we are going to so. talk with him soon. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Well, we are out of time. I can't believe it. But I, I haven't covered my notes. I know. I was just going to say, <laughs> is the next person here already? I have to do this again. <laughs> yeah. I would love to. Can we do that again? Because um, <laughs> I haven't gotten to all my questions either. So. Oh. Bummer. And I want you to be able to say what you want to say too. So thank you, Al. Yeah. It's been yeah. a real pleasure again. But can we talk again soon? I'm sure. Good. I just want All to right. say that, you know, this has been a great company to work for. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's been very enjoyable.
good. I, I hear that over and over again. Yep. I know you, you have heard it too, right? <laughs> so thanks very much. You're welcome.